Senator McCain, uh, Minister Sikorsky, those were brilliant and uh, courageous uh, statements and speeches, uh, uh, very much in the spirit of this lecture. And I would say Bronick would be so pleased, but as well as I got to know him, I never dared call him anything but Professor Goremic. <laughs> and so Professor Goremic would be so pleased. Um, let me open, we've got uh, uh, roughly uh, uh, 20 minutes to a half an hour uh, for questions. Let me open with one that <coughs> drills down a little bit deeper on the Middle East, and then after that with one that drills down on uh, Belarus, and then <coughs> we'll open to the audience. On the Middle East, uh, Senator McCain, um, ensure that there's not another Srebrenica. That's pretty strong language. Uh, on the other hand, Minister Sikorsky says, they're not looking to Gary Cooper for inspiration. We, we can't be sure they will want what we want. What do you do? Uh, if, if you want to turn solidarity to action, is it a no-fly zone in Libya? Is it even more than that? Uh, what, what specifically would you, pr would you prescribe that we do right now in terms of Libya to avoid another Srebrenica, but more broadly across uh, the Middle East? where you don't seem to have the unifying factor of the Soviet Union uh, and Warsaw Pact that there was in the, uh, in the Cold War days. Let me try to be as brief as possible. Um, first of all, I, th uh, I think there are two phases uh, that the United States and our European allies who will play a key role in what happens in the next few months and years one is to help them with the transition to the democratic process, the, the way you organize parties, the way you do voter identification, the, uh, all of the things that are kind of the mechanics of organizing parliamentary slash presidential elections. And by the way, we have to be very careful because they want our assistance. They don't want our interference. And that is one of the messages that I brought back from. Egypt and uh, a couple of the other countries, uh, Tunisia and others. But the second thing, and probably more important in the long run, was what Radek referred to. Either it's got to be economic development in these countries, and it's got to be done by assistance, as Radek talked about, but it's also got to be done by investment. We need job creation. Remember how this thing started. A young man who was a college graduate who was trying to sell vegetables and was denied a license even for doing so and burned himself to death. And that, of, of course, is because of the, there's a whole generation across these countries, but particularly uh, countries like Egypt and Tunisia and Morocco and Jordan that are educated but have no future, no economic future. And so I think our job, uh, our mission, once we get through the period of towards democracy is to provide investment and economic commitments. On Libya itself, um, of course we have to have a no-fly zone. Of course we want to prevent the kind of aerial bombing and attacks that are being orchestrated and might be uh, So you do up. think one should move forward with the no-fly zone? Absolutely. Yeah. And any reason, look, one thing, my friends, I do know a little bit about and that is uh, what motivates uh, people in warfare. Once we announced a no-fly zone, most of those Libya pilots wouldn't fly. And they don't know where, what kind of assets we have in the region or whether we can do it for 24 hours a day or not or all that. You know, if we are spending over a half a trip, we are spending $500 billion, not counting Iraq and Afghanistan, on our nation's defense. Don't tell me we can't do a no-fly zone over Tripoli. I mean, uh, I love the military. I love it my, in my life. But they always seem to find reasons why you can't do something rather than you can. So a no-fly zone is very important. I think we ought to look at the humanitarian assistance. We ought to look, uh, frankly, at supporting a provisional government in Libya. In Benghazi, I think one could be easily set up. and. Uh, this, this guy's days are numbered. The question is, is can we shorten those number of days to, to save lives, to save people's lives, because it's clear he's gonna kill whoever he thinks he can in order to stay in power. I, 
I, I'm sorry for the long answer, but this is really a, 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 an important thing that we join together. By the way, I note that the uh, Prime Minister of England and the President of France have been pretty strong in their comments about what we ought to do as well. Uh, Minister Sikorsky, I wonder if you can pick up on those comments, agree, disagree, and perhaps deepen a little bit your comments uh, about um, uh, they're not looking for Gary Cooper for inspiration, but they're also not burning flags. So where are they looking for inspiration? I think we have developed in the last couple of decades the um, principle of responsibility to protect uh, so it's not just we that can protect. When the leaders don't protect their own people, um, they are not at liberty to oppress them anymore. And so I think it's, um, it was correct of the uh, Security Council to have taken a unanimous decision to refer the case of Libya to the International Criminal Court. Effectively, we have uh, not only called for Colonel Gaddafi to resign, we have announced him to be an outlaw. And that, of course, may have practical consequences, and I don't want to specify those. Um, as regards what we can do for the Middle East, I think this is just the beginning. I mentioned the idea of, um, of the European Endowment for Democracy, and I consciously borrowed the um, uh, the, uh, the name from, from here, from Washington, because we don't want to be uh, in the same position next time, and there will be many next times, that we, need, that we have to choose between a dictator and the radicals. Because dictators are very good at eliminating plausible alternatives to themselves, so we have to step in to, um, to sustain them. And then I believe that the European Union has a, a a unique civilizational attractiveness. We're not very good at marshalling mil military resources, but we are very good at giving an, a, a good example of, of how you uh, organize um, your economy and how you live well. The European Union is an $18 trillion economy, economy the largest economy on Earth. And People want to trade with us, people want to be able to travel to Europe, people want to have closer association with Europe. And Europe is most influential on its own periphery, in its neighborhood. Our problem is that we've developed as a, a, um, as a series of treaties and, and agreements, and that's the way we deal with our neighborhood. I've been arguing with my colleagues in the EU that we should go further. Because before they want investment, they want to trade. They want access to our markets. But the way we operate these days is that that would require years of negotiations. We should be unashamedly political and grant privileges. If you follow the road of democratization, here is access in several sectors. We should also do this on, um, on scholarships, on visas. On, on the things that, um, that, uh, that people find attractive in Europe. And that way, we can um, give them a good example. Thank you for that answer. By the way, the United yes. States should also do trade preference agreements uh, rather than go through the long process of, uh, of more formalized. Uh, we should immediately give trade preference to these countries as well as they move forward.